Hi everyone and welcome back. In this video I have another example for you on working with multivariate limits. In this case we'll be studying the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of 3x squared y divided by x squared plus y squared. We'll either evaluate this limit or prove that the limit doesn't exist. Now you can see I've already started thinking about this example by testing a few paths through the origin. I didn't write it down, but I started by thinking about the limit along the lines x equals 0 or y equals 0. But you can see that if we set x or y equal to 0, well, the numerator of this fraction is going to be 0, and therefore the whole fraction is 0. Consequently, the limit along one of these lines will be 0 as well. So more generally, I decided to consider other lines through the origin, just like we did in our last example. I considered the limit along the line y equals mx. Well, if you test this limit by substituting mx for your y values, you're going to get something like this. The limit as x mx approaches 0, 0 of 3mx cubed divided by x squared plus m squared x squared. Now, in our last example, all of the x's were able to cancel out at this point, but that's not the case here. You see, the powers of x are different in the numerator and denominator, so we're only going to be able to cancel up to x squared. That leaves me with the limit as x mx goes to 0, 0 of 3mx, we still have an x in the numerator, divided by 1 plus m squared. And since m here is a constant, you can see that this limit is going to approach 0. Ooh, now that's pretty cool. We've just shown that no matter which line we follow to get to the origin, my function will always approach a value of 0. Now that's not enough to conclude that the limit is equal to 0, because of course there are many other types of paths that we can take to the origin. Let's test a few more paths just to get a feel for how our function's behaving. On the next slide, we're gonna check parabolic paths. Okay folks, we've just shown that as we approach the origin along any straight line, the value of my function approaches zero. So now we're gonna check some other curves. We're gonna check parabolic paths. I'm gonna start by checking parabolas that pass through the origin and open in the y direction. Parabolas of the form y equals mx squared. So here I'm computing the limit as x mx squared goes to 0, 0 of 3x squared y. So y here is mx squared divided by x squared plus y squared. That's mx squared squared. If we expand and simplify, we get the limit as x mx squared goes to 0, 0 of 3mx to the 4 divided by x squared plus m squared x to the 4. Just like before, we're going to try to cancel some of these x's, but it looks like the largest power of x I can factor in the denominator is x squared, so that's all I can cancel. I get the limit as x mx squared goes to 0, 0 of 3mx squared divided by 1 plus m squared x squared. Okay, we can actually evaluate this limit. The numerator is going to tend to 0, and the denominator is going to tend to 1. So we get 0 over 1. Ooh, the limit is 0 along every single one of these parabolas. So we're not just approaching 0 along lines through the origin, but also along parabolas through the origin that open in the y direction. Well, folks, the same thing is going to occur along parabolas that open in the x direction. And I'm going to leave that to you as an exercise. So as an exercise, verify that our limit is 0 as we approach the origin along any path x equals m y squared, right? That's a parabola opening in the x direction. Okay, I'm starting to get a little suspicious here, folks. Not only does our function approach 0 along any line through the origin, but also along any parabola through the origin that opens in the x or y directions. I'm starting to wonder if maybe this limit exists. Maybe it exists and it's equal to zero. But how do you show that? We'd have to come up with some kind of an argument that no matter what path we take to the origin, the function will always approach a value of zero. On the next slide, I'm gonna show you a trick for doing exactly this. Okay, folks, we suspect that our limit exists and is equal to zero. But to show this, we must demonstrate that our function approaches zero along every path leading to the origin. Here's the trick for showing this. We are going to convert our Cartesian coordinates, x, y, into polar coordinates, rho, phi. Now don't worry, I'm going to give you a reminder of how all of this works, but more importantly, I'm going to explain why converting to polar coordinates might be a good strategy for evaluating this limit. 
So we're all familiar with representing a point in space using Cartesian coordinates x, y, right? Starting at the origin, x tells us how far to move left or right, and y tells us how far to move up or down. Makes sense, doesn't it? But it turns out we can represent this exact same point using two other quantities. The first is the distance from our point x, y to the origin. It's the length of this line segment right here. We denote this length by rho. Now since rho represents a length, rho is always non-negative. Rho is greater than or equal to zero. Our second quantity, phi, tells us the position of our line segment relative to the positive x-axis. It's this angle here, the angle made between the positive x-axis and our line. We can always assume that phi is between zero and two pi. Now being able to convert between Cartesian and polar coordinates is an incredibly useful skill to have. We're gonna be doing this a lot later when we talk about integration. But for now, how do you actually make this conversion? How do you change x's and y's into rows and phi's and vice versa? Well, the answers to these questions lie in our picture. You can see that we're dealing with this right angled triangle here whose side lengths are x, y, and rho. So according to the Pythagorean theorem, rho is given by the square root of x squared plus y squared. We can also use this picture to say something about phi. We know that tan phi is gonna be equal to the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. So here, tan phi is y over x. And there you go, two formulas that you can use to convert rows and phi's into x's and y's. Well, that's great, but in today's lesson, we actually wanna go the other way. We wanna convert x's and y's into rows and phi's. I feel like Dr. Seuss here. Well, once again, our picture and a little trigonometry are gonna to come to our rescue. Based on our picture, we know that cos phi is going to be the adjacent side x divided by the hypotenuse rho. So if we rearrange this a little bit, we can write x as rho cos phi. Likewise, we can write y as rho sine phi. And there you go, formulas for converting x's and y's into rho's and phi's. Okay, on to the big question. Why might converting to polar coordinates be helpful for evaluating this limit? Well, let's think about this. If x, y is approaching zero, zero along some crazy path to the origin, well, then the distance to the origin, this quantity rho, must be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It must tend to zero. So what we're saying is, if x, y is approaching zero, zero, then rho must be approaching zero as well. In fact, it approaches from the right, since rho is always positive. Conversely, however, if we have a collection of points whose distance to the origin is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and is tending to zero, well then eventually those points must end up in this circle right here. And after a little while longer, the points actually have to end up in this slightly smaller circle. And eventually the points even have to end up in this teeny tiny circle around the origin. You can see that since the points are being pulled into these circles, x and y must be tending to zero. So we actually get the reverse direction as well. x, y approaches zero, zero, if and only if rho tends to zero from the right. Now this is the big idea, folks. By converting from Cartesian to polar coordinates, we can convert a two-variable limit, which is something we generally find difficult to work with, into a one variable limit, which is something that's more familiar. Let me show you what happens when we convert this limit into polar coordinates. Okay, folks, here's our limit once again. I'm gonna convert to polar coordinates by writing x as rho cos phi and y as rho sine phi. Now remember, x, y tends to zero, zero if and only if rho tends to zero from the right. So I can write this as the limit as rho goes to zero from the right, of three times rho cos phi squared, rho sine phi, divided by rho cos phi squared plus rho sine phi squared. Just like before, we're gonna expand and simplify. In the numerator, I have three rho cubed cos squared phi sine phi, and in the denominator, it looks like each term has a rho squared. So I'm gonna factor that out to get rho squared cos squared phi plus sine squared phi. Now at this point, there's quite a bit that can be simplified. 
cos squared phi plus sine squared phi is of course one, and it looks like I can cancel some rows. I'll cancel a row squared up top and down below. That leaves me with the limit as rho goes to zero from the right of three rho cos squared phi sine phi. At this point, you can really appreciate the power of converting to polar coordinates. You see, since rho is going to zero, this first term, three rho, is also going to zero. What about the second term? Well, I'm not really sure what's happening here because phi could take on any value between zero and two pi, right? We can be approaching the origin from many, many different angles. But one thing's for sure, this expression is bounded, right? It can't blow up to infinity. Cos squared phi is always between zero and one, and sine phi is always between minus one and one. So this expression is contained somewhere in the interval between minus one and one. It's bounded. The exciting thing is, if you take a bounded quantity and you multiply it by something that tends to zero, well, the whole limit is gonna be pulled down to zero with it. So this limit is zero. Pretty cool, huh? You can actually see this behavior in the graph of our function. The graph looks a little funky around the origin, but still, no matter what crazy path we take to get there, we can see that our function is always approaching a value of zero. I'm gonna end this video with a couple words of warning about using polar coordinates to evaluate multivariate limits. Firstly, our polar coordinates trick only applies to limits where both x and y are going to zero. If x or y is not going to zero, well, we can still use the trick, but we first have to convert to a limit of this form. Maybe I'll say a bit more about this on Piazza. Secondly, if we convert to polar coordinates and end up with an expression involving phi, we should always confirm that that expression is bounded. In our last example, we showed that that was indeed the case, but it's easy to get carried away if you're not careful. Take this limit, for example. The limit as x, y approaches 0, 0 of x squared over y. If we convert to polar coordinates, we end up with the limit as rho goes to 0 from the right of rho times cos squared phi over sine phi. Now it's very tempting to say that since this term goes to 0, it will pull the whole limit down to 0 with it, but that's simply not true. You see, this expression here is not bounded. If we approach the origin along a path where our terms sine phi get really, really close to zero, well, then this expression is gonna blow up to infinity. Our limit would then be of the form zero times infinity, which is indeterminate. In fact, this limit is not equal to zero. The limit doesn't exist. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to show that that's the case.